Good afternoon and good morning, depending on what part of the country you're in. Verl Workman here. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I appreciate all of our clients. This is a team leader webinar for Workman Success Systems. For those of you who are just jumping on, uh, I want to start by saying how much I appreciate all of you as clients. You have to know that as we look at your work bench and we look at the, the impact that we're having on your business and your lives, I'm humbled by the amount of work that all of you do. And you have to know that uh, I recognize it. You know, when our team leaders are moving the needle and they're actually doing something different in their business and I see them making progress, uh, that's when I get the most excited. And I'm excited to have all of you here. I'm, 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 I'm grateful for your business. And I want you to know that we're committed to helping you be successful. As part of that commitment to your success, you know, I was thinking about what we wanted to accomplish on today's webinar. Really what I want to do is I want to help you as team leaders become better leaders. And in order to do that, I brought in two of our best leaders to share with you thoughts on leadership and how they actually have taken their teams and created an environment that allows them to live, uh, well, I'll call it to live well. And everybody has a different definition of what it means to live, to live well. I promise you that there will be some ideas and some nuggets and some things that we share with you that will have value. I also encourage you to stay on the call today in between both of our presenters as we talk about leadership and developing the leader within because both Nate Martinez and Cleve Gaddis have a wealth of information and they will, um, they're open to questions. They want to have it to be interactive. So I have, I have multiple screens going on right here and in one of my screens you're going to see I've got uh, all these questions and comments and people that are coming in here and I appreciate everybody, uh, everybody's uh, interaction. So before we get going, I want everybody to recognize that one of the greatest things we've done over the last two years is we put on an event called Leverage. And last year we did Leverage in Scottsdale, Arizona, where the first day we did the team games. We had a, a national team builder come in and do these amazing games, and then we had two days of amazing content. This year we're doing the same thing, except it's going to be in Orlando, Florida. And what I learned from Leverage is, is the clients that attend Leverage and bring their teams have a much higher buy-in of all of the systems and the processes that we teach. And so you can now pre-register for Leverage 20, go to leverage20.com, and it's going to be at the Orlando World Center Marriott, which is a beautiful facility with restaurants and uh, outdoor um, swimming and great things for kids, and we're going to make it a great event. And then a bunch of us are either going to stay right before or right after and kind of extend our trip and make it a little be a Disney trip. And so a lot of our team leaders are taking the opportunity because leverage is in Orlando to create sales incentives and opportunities for their team members to earn their way to leverage and to get additional things. So put that on your calendar. Let's get you registered in advance. And uh, I look forward to seeing you there. As we jump in, let me introduce, first of all, uh, uh, Cleve Gaddis. Cleve is the managing partner and broker at Gaddis Partners. He's one of our master coaches. Cleve's a consultant and a speaker. He does a great job. He learned sales the hard way. I love it. Uh, you know, what I think the first time Cleve and I talked was, I don't know, maybe uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, I think uh, Cleve heard me talk about how I used to sell hot tubs and satellite dishes at the state fair. And he right. said, hey, you got nothing on me, man. I used to sell vacuums door to door. And as we had that conversation, you know, we realized we were cut from the same cloth that we just love the process of selling and helping people grow. I think uh, it loves to share systems. Go ahead, please. I think that might be defective, Paul. We were cut from defective cloth. <laughs> Def yeah, that's exact that's exactly right. <laughs> you know, fun thing about Cleve is he runs a very successful team. And not only is he a master coach, runs a successful team, he's also a radio host on ESPN Radio in Atlanta, Georgia. And so he's a bit of a celebrity. I like to say he's a legend in his own booth. And, uh, <laughs> and that's probably true. And then we also have one of my favorite people in the entire world, and that's Nate Martinez. Nate and I have been friends for probably going on 20 years. Nate used to hire me to come in and do events for his brokerages. He's a REMAX broker owner with multiple office multiple offices in uh, sunny Arizona. He's had his offices for over 30 years. He's one of the legends. With, you go to one of the REMAX conferences, you go to an R4 or one of the REMAX conferences, you walk down the hall with Nate, and uh, you can't go more than two or three steps without getting stopped by somebody who wants to talk to him or catch up or uh, recognizes that, that he's made an impact on their career. He's one of the most influential people in our industry. Nate is a senior level coach, so he coaches brokers and owners that also run teams. He runs a successful brokerage with, you know, a, a couple hundred agents, as well as a successful 
seven figure team. And so the dynamics of doing those two things are just a huge undertaking. Um, he's very fortunate to have two of his kids working in the business. Nate and I have that in common together where his, uh, well, actually, two of his kids and his wife. He's got Tanya, and he's got Brandy, and he's got Nate Jr. all working with him in the business, which I think is great. He's an avid sports enthusiast, but more important than sports, he's like a concert junkie. If yes, he Nate is. doesn't have a, an 80s rock concert T-shirt on, then you're probably running into the wrong guy. Uh, his personal, personal philosophy is a great uh, Wayne Gretzky quote that says, you know, everybody else skates to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck is going, and I love that. And that's, you know, thinking ahead of where people are and what's happening in the industry and getting there before everybody else gets there. And so, Nate and Cleve, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for sharing your insight with everybody. I'm excited for our conversation today. And, Nate, let's, uh, let's jump in with you first. How's the weather in Arizona? Is it still perfect? Yeah, it's beautiful. I had a little, little sprinkle this morning, which we, we, we love it when it rains here. Uh, it's funny that you talk about concerts. I had 10 tickets for last night's Rolling Stones concert here in Phoenix. Oh. It, you know, interesting on systems, I got a survey asking how the concert was, even though it was canceled uh, a month ago. <laughs> so uh, it's, in, it's in Qualtrics. <laughs> Why was it canceled? Huh? Why was it canceled? Because uh, Mick Jagger had a heart surgery. Oh, geez. Okay, well, yeah. yeah. I figured it had something to do with age. There you go. That's part of it, right? Um, so wow. leadership, you know, uh, uh, it's an exciting subject for sure. So I think a lot of leadership just starts with the mindset, having the right mindset. So, you know, there's so many books on leadership. It's probably one of the uh, largest sections in the self-help uh, section in, in bookstores or online. But I think leadership is just a way of, of helping people get what they want, you know, um, a lot of people don't even know what they want, so helping them define what they want is a, is a good part of leadership. Uh, training, uh, setting goals, giving direction. Uh, I think some of the leadership skills that I possess was really just a vision. Yeah, I can see things before they happen, kind of like what you're talking about with Wayne Gretzky. You know, you can see trends before they happen, and if you act on them in the right way, uh, it, you know, it's going to have a profound impact on you. Uh, the same with when you're bringing people into your, to my real estate company or onto the team, uh, having that skill and developing that skill and it's something I continue to develop every day. You know, I don't think you become a leader and you quit learning. I think you are a continuous learner. Uh, that's why, you know, I, I coach with Workman. It's been three years coaching with uh, both Burl and Clee as my coaches. And it's been, it's been a game changer, right? So their leadership empowers me to be a better leader, not only on my real estate team, but my real estate company, and then also the community at large. So I think leadership is just, uh, it's pretty good. You know, I think a leader is a mentor. Uh, mentors, uh, we've all had them in our lives, and I think they've impacted us. I, I just got a letter from a very uh, high producing agent that worked for me five, 10 years ago, and it literally brought tears to my eyes. We kind of disconnected but he and pointed all these things that he realized that he learned by our relationship and there's nothing that feels better than that that's better than any commission check I ever cash is it's when that you had an impact on, on the MX. I love it you know and uh, you know my one of my old mentors used to say the amount of people that show up at your funerals in direct proportion to the weather on that day you know and uh, I think uh, I think when I've been to you know, great leaders, the amount of people that show up, regardless of the weather, is, is because they've touched so many people. So we all have that within us to, to make sure that we're reaching out and, and helping people. So Nate, when you think about, just out of curiosity, when you think about your role as a leader, how do you define your primary responsibility? What is your job? Well, you know, I, th I think the vision is, is really my job. I have, I have, uh, Vision. I have growing. Uh, you know, I, I think my job in that aspect is to to basically meet with them once a week. We have a, a team meeting. 
Uh, we have two huddles, one on Monday and Friday that's done by Zoom. Where we're really just looking at what are their top three priorities. Uh, and, and that's pretty much how I lead that company. I, I lead that company by meeting with our agents, going to lunch with our agents, talking to them, being very open. I'm a very open leader, meaning people can call me just about any time. And if I'm available, I, I want to help them, you know. Uh, as far as leading the team, you know, one of the, one of the fun things that uh, you two gentlemen are being able to witness is, is turning my son into a leader and having him take some uh, responsibilities where he really didn't want the responsibility a couple of years ago and, and starting to uh, impart some leadership skills on him. And that's, that's, that's been really rewarding as well as a father and as a leader. You know, so I think on the team, it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's meeting with the team uh, and basically just giving them direction and guidance. So, yeah, I, I love that. I love the sharing the vision. I love the idea of meeting with the team and giving them vision and direction. Um, how do you keep your meetings when you're meeting with the team and you're giving them vision and direction? Do you have a, a formal schedule that you follow or do you wing it each week? What is it that, what is it that makes the meetings so that they're productive and meaningful? Well, you know, we, we do have an agenda that we try to stay to every single week. Sometimes I have the gift of gab and I go off agenda probably more than I should. And my one hour meeting tends to be 90 minutes. You know, I get very passionate when there's a subject I'm trying to teach to the team. Right. So, but we do have a system and, and my son's starting to take part of that meeting now with all the numbers and accountability and, and kind of helping our agents, which is really freeing me up. Uh, you know, one of the things that I wanted to share is this, you know, you have, you should, you know, I, I have had a morning ritual for about a year or two now, where I go through about the same process every day. And if I go through that process every day, I just seem to have a better day. You know, if I take the time to think about my day, you know, think about, and what we have up there on the screen are basically different uh, rituals. And that came from the book, uh, Miracle Morning by Hal Alrod, I mean, where you just take a little time to either pray or meditate, read your affirmations. I've, I've been told to read my affirmations for the last 30 years of being in real estate and, and really been doing it more in the last year than I probably have done in the previous 30 plus years. You know, the visualization part of, of that morning routine is really, you know, can you see everything that's happening during, during the day? If I forget to do this one, my day is chaotic. But if I visualize how the day is going to be, how the appointments are going to be, the people I'm going to meet with, if I kind of see that in the morning, it just seems to flow better. Exercising, I'm, I'm at the gym with a trainer. I, I'm not a big fan of working out, so I have to pay. It's another coach that I have to pay to, to get work out for you. <laughs> yeah, I watch them work out. You know? <laughs> but, you know, exercising, you know, it's in the days I don't work out, I, I try to take the dog for anywhere from a 30 to an hour walk. It's really the dog's walking me. Uh, and then reading. You know, I do a lot of my reading on audio. So I could be walking the dog and listening to an audio book. And then taking time to just journal. You know, I mean, that's just a routine that I try to do every day. And while I do that, when I do this, my days are just better. Hey, hey, Verl, can, can yeah. I only because I'm actually monitoring uh, questions from attendees, and we've got a couple here for Nate. Do you mind if we if we jump right on in with these, or do you want? Did you want to wait? No, go ahead. Oh, so one of them is is from Brittany K. Uh, it says, "Are you able?" And this is for Nate. Are you able to speak a bit more to the sales huddles via Zoom uh, that you hold weekly with your agents? What is covered, and how do you hold your agents accountable? That's a great question. Okay, so that's done with my real estate team. That's the, the, the my broker, my assistant broker, my CEO, uh, and the other different uh, leaderships uh, managers in my company. So we, we just we just do a half hour, right? And also, I really want them to do is tell me what are the top three priorities that they're going to work on this week. And then on Friday, it's a check in to how they do with those top three. What's interesting? Sometimes I get a list of six or seven, and I really only want three because I know that. If we can get the three most important things done each week, it's moving the ball forward, right? And that's all I'm trying to do is move the ball forward every single week. <clears throat> Love it. And then uh, Troy writes, I'm just starting to build a team. What advice do you have for putting your vision together and implementing that vision to grow your team? 
Well, you know, kind of the Stephen Covey start with the end in mind. You know, you really need to understand what you want your team to look like. You know, if uh, uh, what, one of the processes we do as coaches is we use a strategic plan where we'll kind of have our uh, our clients just look at what what does it look like in in ninety days from now. What does what your business look like? What things do you want to accomplish? What does it look like a year from now? What does it look three years from now? And then again, what does it look five years from now? And just kind of stretching out there because I think once you set your vision in place on where you're going to be, it's, it, it, you're going to get there, right? But if you don't have a map, you can't get there. So sometimes you just have to have the vision, even if you don't know that it's right. Here's another one. And what a great question. This is from Stuart. And I'm sorry, Verl. Is it okay? I hope you're okay with these questions. I love it. When <laughs> yeah, they no, I see them. I, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing them too. Oh, you go ahead. You start asking them. Sorry, I was trying to help you so you didn't have to pay attention to two things. No, it's all good. Please go ahead. Uh, so, Stuart Sinclair, do you ever get the feeling, and I guess this is for Nate as well, that you're babysitting, or are the systems in place to prevent that from happening? What a great, great question. <laughs> well, sometimes you feel that way, you know, and, and I think systems are the solution, right? I think by implementing the systems uh, is key. And, and within the workman systems, there's so many systems, and uh, I still have not mastered them, but the more systems we put in place to, to like it's help the process or maybe even protect our agents from doing something wrong, it just, it just flows better. So I think systems are your solution. You know, I, so when we talk about leadership and Cleve, I'll get to where I ask you some of these same questions because I think you'll have uh, just different ways of looking at things. I think each leader looks at their business differently based on the experiences they've had in their life. And so, uh, the different perspectives is really interesting that you, you mentioned something at the beginning when we first started today, you said that, you know, how many, how many books are written on leadership? Did you say on audible? Yeah. Uh, 45, 47, 4,557 books. Yeah. And that's probably not all of them. Yeah. You know, whenever I go to a national speakers association meeting or I meet with a local chapter and people say, well, what do you do? And I say, well, what do you do? I would say that 95% of the people I talk to say, Oh, I, I mean, I teach leadership. And so uh -huh. everybody's teaching it. Most of them aren't even good leaders. They only have a business of one. And their business is teaching other people how to be great leaders, even though they've never done it, which I think is fascinating. And so as a team leader and someone who's running an office, uh, your leadership is real. You actually have to get people to follow you. You can't be in business 30 years without being a good leader. I like to say that, uh, you know, people don't leave brands and they don't leave companies, but they leave leaders. And so if you're having a lot of turnover, then you, instead of looking at the market or looking at the competitors, we need to get out the mirror and look in the mirror and ask ourselves the question, hmm. are we stepping up to the role and are we stepping up to that mantle of leadership? Are we being the kind of leader of a company that we'd stay with? Or if a leader treated us like that, would we leave? And so I think that, that, that attitude says a lot, about, a lot about you as a leader. Love this Blue Angel flight, man. I sat by a Blue Angel pilot on a plane recently yeah, no, you know, I, I, I grabbed that slide for one reason. It's like these guys are so preci precision, they're perfect, right? And they get so much done. Uh, when, when you taught me, Vero, about the perfect week, I've heard the concept for years, right? And I thought about it, you know, and, but you kind of pounded into my head. And, and I thank you for that because this is the way my week is now. It's very precise. It's very cut up into different chunks of time, you know. I carry my perfect week uh, with me in my in my journal. It's it's in my hold that, hold that up hold that up for a second, Nate. Let's hold that right up to your camera. I want everybody to look at that. So that's a that's a copy of the perfect week out of your Google Drive that everybody has access to. But Nate actually takes it and puts it into his journal, and he has it every day, every morning. He's looking at that perfect week, and then intentionally creating the business and life that he wants. I love that you do that. You showed that this morning. Yeah, and you know, uh, the key is what, what I did, I have to live this. So I created in my electronic calendar a very light uh, schedule called Perfect Week. And so as long as it's checked on, it fills my whole week from here to eternity, right, of what I need to be doing on that day anytime in the future. So what's really great if somebody says, hey, what are you doing on May 23rd at 3 o'clock? I know that from 3 to 6 o'clock, I'm blocked for listing appointments, right? If somebody wants me to list a home, and, and I'm, I'm out there listing and selling still, right? Running a real estate company, running a team. Uh, 
but because of the perfect week, I can honestly tell you where I'll be at six o'clock tonight and I'll tell you where I'll be this weekend. And both of those answers is not at work, right? I might be thinking about work at home. I might follow up on a call, but I don't have any appointments after 5.30, Monday through Friday, and any appointments on the weekend. Now, will I work on the weekends? Yes, there's gonna be that one or two times, uh, maybe a quarter where I, I need to be present. But I built my business based on this perfect week so I can have a life, which in real estate, it's funny, people will work 24 seven. And I did that probably for the first 30 plus years of my career is I just worked, right, so. You know, it's interesting. I, so you brought something up. I've never seen anybody do that before. I don't know if you've never shared that with me. But so in your Google Calendar, you can have a, a calendar for birthdays or family or workmen or travel. I have one for pending events. But I've never thought to take my perfect week and make a light shaded color and turn it on mm -hmm. and have that be like an overlay on my Google Calendar. And yeah. so when I go to put something in, it shows up as an overlay right on my Google Calendar. I think that's brilliant. I'm totally going to talk about that and share that with the other coaches. Have you seen that before, Cleve? Nope. Nope. Never. And I'm, I'm sorry. I, I love that. I've been doing that for like two years. I just love it. You know, it keeps me. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for holding out on us. Yeah. It keeps me focused. I feel like I'm one of these jet pilots on my schedule now. Yeah. Yeah. I love the jet pilots and I love the way that they end all their debriefings with glad to be here. And I'm certainly glad you're here, Nate. Thank you. Glad to be here. <laughs> So, you know, I think one of the things I want to talk to is about when leadership is starting with why, you know, why, why are you a leader? You know, what are you trying to accomplish? And uh, the couple of books that I'll point out, one of them is called Start With Why, and the other one is Leaders Eat Last, both by the same author, Simon Sinek. And uh, if you want to get some inspiration, you go, go look at Simon on, on TED Talks. He's, uh, he's got They're some awesome. speeches. And uh, it's really interesting, you know, for me, going back and looking at why I do, why do I own a real estate company? Why do I have a team? And, a lot, you know, for me, it's just like, I, I really enjoy helping people. You know, I think it's, uh, uh, I like to make money, don't, don't misunderstand me. But I think to own a real estate company, it's, uh, it's definitely a labor of love. And I think it's something that uh, I truly enjoy doing. I, I enjoy watching people grow. And everybody's why is different, you know, but I think at least on, the, on owning the real estate side of it, it's more of a, of, of the enjoyment of, of the growth of people, right? For me, uh, on, on the team side of it, it's, it's building up people, you know, building up my, my kids, you know, my, uh, my other coworkers, my teammates, you know, that's, that's leaving a legacy when you can help build somebody into somebody that some of them don't even know what they want to be yet when they grow up, you know, and, and I think sometimes it takes us uh, realtors trying to figure out where do we want to be. I know I don't want to be what I see a lot of is a lot of people that have to work yeah. into their seventies and eighties and they have to, I mean, there's really no other choice, you know, that to, to sustain their lifestyle. I want to be able to uh, uh, build a team so I can, I can relax a little more and then help them get, get their goals achieved. So would you say, Nate, that you think that sometimes when people have to work too long, it's a little bit self-imposed because they don't think about the future enough today to save for it and make plans for it and things like that? Oh, and yeah. That's yeah. first question. So, and then we also, how, Howie Green wants to know if you'll show your perfect week calendar with the Google Calendar overlay. He might just want to know exactly how that works. So maybe you could answer my first question and then, and then uh, answer Howie's. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Ask, ask me the first so, question. So, so I'm sorry. I shouldn't. Ask, that's not fair to ask two at a time. <laughs> Let me ask four at a time. So the first one is: Do you think people who have to work into their 70s oh, yeah. and 80s, it's a little bit of sort of self-induced, meaning they should have done things differently to prepare for retirement, like save some freaking money? Yeah, uh, we, move through this. being our own best customer, right? We we sell so many great real estate deals. You know, we should buy them, right? Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, going back over the years, if I could have bought some of those, you were around back then, Cleve, you used to be able to buy houses with no money down, no qualifying, you know, could you have bought, and I bought a hundred of those back then. Can't do that today, you know, but uh, I, I think being your own best customer, uh, buying real estate, having investment real estate, I think the key concept that we all need to be working towards is figuring out how do we earn money without working, 
right? If you have multiple pillars of income, be it rental, uh, you know, like, you know, today uh, I have probably 18 different types of levels of income coming into my, to my world, right? Some are just little nickels and dimes coming in. Some of them have a pretty good return. So uh, I, I want to live a long time and I want to give a lot of money away. So for me, it's important. So I think we should do that. Going to the calendar. Yep. Again, it's just like, you know, on, on a Google calendar or an Apple calendar, it doesn't really matter. Um, so like, I don't know if you can really see, like here's on my, my uh, iPad. I just create a calendar. I have different color codes in my calendar for different calendars. Like if it's a, a Remax event, I have a Remax calendar. If Remax has, we have a we have a training schedule for our company. It's all you can subscribe to it on a Google Calendar. So if somebody just wants to subscribe to it, then it puts all those classes throughout the month or quarter on your calendar automatically. And it was just a real simple calendar, and I called it a perfect week. And I just went through. Very simply, I took my, my old school one here and I just looked at it and I said, you know, six or 5.30 a.m. at the gym. So I just have a workout. So I have on my calendar here um, from, from 5.30 to 6.30, workout Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Friday, cardio Tuesdays and Thursdays, right? I have to get ready, eat, take me to school, the next uh, section. Uh, then I try to plan the day, just spend that little time and thought, you know, before that, what wasn't even on there was the miracle morning from, from five to five thirty. Okay. Before I go to the gym. So I just put all these things in there and then I just have them, um, repeat. So again, I can go five years out of my calendar at five thirty. It's going to say be at the gym. Right. So just a simple thing. And you could turn it off and on. Mine's just always on. Uh, and, it, it gets and then you schedule the rest of your life over what you've intentionally created. I think it's, I think it's so cool. You were talking about, you were talking about why and helping people get to their real why. I mean, do you really, do you really do that, or do you just? No, well, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, you. I don't think you can motivate people, right? I don't think you can really motivate people until you know why they're doing something. You know, as an owner of a real estate company, here's what I hear when people come in to to interview. Well, I like people. I like houses. I love watching <laughs> TV. Right? And, you know, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said that, I could probably retire, right? But I, I think the key is, is unless you know why they're doing something, it's really hard to motivate them, right? Everybody wants everybody that comes in, they want to earn $100,000. Just seems to be the number. But you can't help somebody get to 100000 Like I'm coaching one of my team members now. He, he, he struggled uh, a little bit, but, you know, I finally figured out what his why was, right? His why was, well, he's got some, some debt from his kid's college and so forth, and he wants to get that down. And I figured out how much that was. He told me we started working on that. And, and uh, just this past week, his daughter's getting married. I said, you get a new why now, don't you? And he goes, yes, I do, you know, because now they have to prepare for a wedding, you know? So if you find out what their why is, you can then, I think, move them along or help them get to where they need to go, right? And some people, it's, you know, taking care of an elderly parent. Uh, I, I had a gal that worked for us that her goal, her, her husband was in the automotive, like a car dealership and worked like 70, 80 hours a week, insane. Her goal is so he didn't have to work, right? She wanted to be the income earner and she's done a really good job, you know, and I've seen her blossom over the year, but that's her driving force. Now she's added a couple of grandkids to the, to the mix and it changed. I think the why changes, you know? So sure. I love this graphic of the team buoying somebody up. You know, it's everybody working together to help the one person on the team that needs that help. Yeah. And I think, you know, I would like to even this graphic for another guy to have his hand where somebody's pulling him up and then pulling the next person up because I think we're all doing that. And when you're a learning-based individual and, and you're willing to help people, I think that's, uh, I think what leadership is all about. So I guess tell you, Nate, I've been, I've been working with uh, Kirk Weisler on his new book. And his new book is all about this uh, man who found a piece of a mirror and he goes out in the world and tries to shine light on places that light never sees. When I saw this graphic, I thought about that. 
Yeah, you know, for, for me, especially when we're doing our team meetings now and we're looking at uh, our daily success habits with our agents, what I think here is my focus is, is I want to illuminate the positive that somebody's doing, right? So uh, I have a new guy on the team that's only been licensed three months, and he's giving an example. He had a lot of points. He has, he has, each week he has one of the highest points of all of our team members, and we have nine people on the team putting their points in. And I asked Jim, I said, can you tell me about that? And I opened it up and I looked at his points and he had over 200 doors he knocked that, that week. I've never been a door knocker and I was fascinated. And I said, what's that like? He goes, well, I, I, I listed a house. I know, he goes, I, I got a buyer and I sold him a house. <laughs> I'm like, I was so excited for him because I've never knocked on the door and I never got a buyer from that. <laughs> it's but, awesome. But it's just, you know, so what I try to do is I try to find the good and as everybody's a team leader here, and we know we get frustrated with our team not doing daily success habits, we have to find the good and illuminate the good. Let's not talk about who's not doing something. Let's illuminate the people that are having success with it that will hopefully motivate the other people to say, God, if he can do it, I can do it too. I love, I love that segue, Nate. And thank you for your insights on leadership. And it's time, to, it's time to shine a light on Cleve for just a minute if we can. As we're talking about leadership, Cleve has been really an interesting uh, person to have in my life because he's constantly pushing me to be a better leader, and he helps me develop the leaders that are on my team as well. Um, Cleve, welcome. And you know, when you think about leadership, I mean, how do you how do you view yourself as a leader? What's your like? If you were to describe your leadership style, how would you describe it? So you want me to be honest, totally honest and transparent? Yeah. I would say. Yep that my leadership style has been awful for the majority of my adult life. And only in the last four to five years have I started to get little inklings of what good leaders do. And the reality is, Burl, is that as a successful entrepreneur or a successful salesperson like you, like Nate, and by the way, every time I'm around Nate Martinez, I just freaking love it. Uh, I met him for the first time probably 11 years ago, and he's such a uh, when Nate says he wants to help people, he, he, it is so freaking true. And he's just, he's an inspiration. So thanks for setting this kind of stuff up. But the reality is, is what we think we're supposed to do because we're entrepreneurs and good salespeople and team leaders is almost always not what we need to do. And it's such a weird thing because our so, sort of knee jerk reaction, our, our ingrained feeling, our m emotions that flow up, unfortunately, they're making us think like we're producing instead of teaching other people to produce. So the message that I was hoping to get through on today's um, webinar is that, you know, if all the world is going one way and if your thoughts are all pointing one way, you need to stop. You need to be careful as a leader because probably what you need to be doing is exactly the opposite. And it's such a weird thing. So being a good leader is really about doing less, not doing more. Being a good leader is almost sometimes you'll feel like you're cheating the system just a little bit because your job as a leader is to get your people to do the things they need to do in order to be successful. And it's just, bro, most of the, by the way, the reason I'm able to point out to you things that I think you should improve on is because when I see you doing something or saying something, I'm like, holy crap, <laughs> that's exactly what I would do. And when I do it, it feels right. But when Burl does it, it seems wrong. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but, but I mean, it's, so we're true. all, we are all that way. Meaning that there's, there, I wish to say we were unique, but entrepreneurs, team leaders, people who are very successful, we're all wired up pretty much the same. So give me an example of, something opposite like you think one way but you really need to be doing so, the opposite so give me an example so let's i i think i have five examples for you so if you want to just go to the next slide i'll uh, i'll start talking about one so so one of the things that and this is part of the rockefeller habits is you have to keep the rhythm of your meetings so so you're, if you're supposed to have daily huddles, or you, you know, maybe you do those four days a week, or on my team, I do a daily huddle every Monday morning via Zoom, 15 minutes with my agents, 15 minutes with my staff. I do an hour and a half weekly team meeting on Wednesday. I do an hour and a half weekly training with my team on Fridays. And it really doesn't matter where I am in the world or what I'm doing, 
those are the things that I do. Now, sometimes if I physically can't be there for the meetings on Wednesday, then I skip those, but I, you know, the same agenda is, is taking place. But like when I'm in Salt Lake city with you on Friday, bro, before you guys ever get to the office, I will have had my training with my agents an hour and a half via zoom. And it's, it's not that they have to get information from me. It's that I need to keep the rhythm consistent. So it provides consistency and stability, but more importantly, it allows them to communicate with me. So anytime they're with me, it allows them to talk to me about their concerns and their this. And so the rhythm of the meetings is not so that you can tell everybody what to do. And so we think as leaders, the reason I have to have these meetings is because I have to teach all these. Uh, let me use uh, the example. Who was it that said we're, we're babysitting? Uh, let's see. Yeah. Here. Was Stuart has said so we think we're having these meetings so because we're babysitting but that's not it at all we're having these meetings because it allows consistent rhythm for people to communicate with us not for us to communicate with them and it's huge it's huge so number one in Nate mentioned his meeting rhythm so you're recruiting you're training you're tracking it helps all of those things when you're having the rhythm of your meetings and I know Nate that's something that you've struggled with is keeping your meetings consistent because you like to travel a lot. I think that's great. And, and now you're starting to rely more on your son to keep the rhythms consistent. And you know, the jury's still out. Will it work? Will it not work? I don't know. But the reality is, is that you're starting to realize that that's so important to keep that rhythm consistent because it allows that communication. So this is the best. I just love this slide. So in the bottom, I have a team member. And on the top, I have a team leader. And so the team leader up top, that's the way they see everything. So it's like, it's so simple, guys. It's all very simple. You just do this and you say this, and this is just what happens. And so the way a team leader thinks that you train is you teach other people what you do. But when you do that as a team leader, you're so flipping good at what you do that it actually makes it worse for your team members because what they see is the gobbledygook written on the board, even though you see the equations perfectly at the top. And so when you're training, you need to keep, so if it's, let me just teach you what I do. I'm okay with that as a leader, as long as you have a written system. And so instead of me saying to you, Verl, hey, when they say this, just say this and blah, blah, blah. As long as I have something in writing for you that I can teach you, then I'm basically te teaching you the system that works, not necessarily to do things like I do it. Does that make sense, Verl? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, and I get, I get frustrated with that. I want people to think and act and behave the way I do. I've given them the script. Why can't they? But they just don't. They and it's because, it's because they don't think the way you do. So if you help your team members and your staff and your salespeople, if you help them think like you do and help them process information like you do. So if somebody says to me on a listing presentation, hey, just so you know, I don't have to sell my house. Well, I know what to say when they say that because people have said it to me a thousand times and I say the same thing every single time. So if I want to teach my listing partners to handle that, I need to write out what I say. I need to write out why I say it and I need to not teach them to do what I do. I need to teach them the system that makes them successful. And those are two entirely different things. And so most of the conversations I have with my successful team leaders, Burl, they, they, they come from a point of frustration where the team member is just not doing what the team leader expects. But the reality is the team leader has never shown them or written out for them or recorded a video for them or taken them and shown them what they expect them to do. So the reality is, is in order to make for the team member on the bottom of this slide, in order for everything to be as clear as it is for the team leader, the team leader must watch what the team member does, must find the gaps between what the team member does and what the team leader expects them to do, and then they must train them for the gap. Hmm. Must train them for the gap. So they, they need to realize where their team members are performing and what they're saying and what they're doing. So as an example, 
Burl, if you got 100 leads and you expected your handoff percentage to be 16% and your handoff percentage was 8%, then where as a leader do you think you need to focus to help that person have a higher conversion percentage? <clears throat> The, the gaps between the eight and the 16. So it's the right. communication or what's happening in the handoff. It's that, it's that difference. It's what they're doing or what they're saying, period. Yep. How often they're following up, what they're doing. So you find the gaps in performance and then you train them to improve where there's a gap. So this next slide is, you know, tracking, tracking, tracking. And we've got, you know, lead tracker, closing tracker, transaction tracker. We've got all kinds of stuff here. And, and the point is, is that as a good leader, I used to dig way down into the details and Burl, I would try to make you a better salesperson by beating your brains in about all these different leads you've been given and asking you why you hadn't handled it correctly. But the reality is, as a good leader, we need to have that 30,000 foot level where we can measure what people are doing. So the reason that you track everything is so that you can find where people are lacking in performance so that you can train them to perform better. So let me give you some numbers we use on our business. Number one, <clears throat> of all the leads that flow in, whether they're Zillow, whether they're Sync leads, Boomtown leads, whatever they are, we expect to be able to hand off to our agents 16% of the lead flow. So 16 out of 100, we expect to hand them off. I expect for the agents to be able to meet face to face with 90% of the handoffs we give them. And I expect them to close 30% of the people they meet with face to face. So a hundred to 16, if you take the 16, you take the 16 and we expect them to meet with 90%. That is we expect them to meet with 14.4 and we expect them to close 30%, which means I expect them to close 4.32 of every hundred deals. Now the reality is, Verl, we do not do that. We probably right. close closer to two to two and a half percent of our lead flow instead of the 4.3. But if I don't have these benchmarks to talk about, these conversion percentages to talk about, I don't, I can't create consistency in the messaging and I can't get the agent to sort of start to hold themselves accountable. So if Verl, if I was your son and you wanted me to behave a certain way, then you need to tell me in advance what that way is so I can measure myself against that benchmark that you've established for me. And so the way it works is this, here's how it works. Number one, we don't tell people what we expect generally. And number two, we yell at them or fuss at them or make them feel bad or blame it on them when they don't do what we expect them to do, but we never told them what we expected to do in the first place. And then we I saw a great example we wonder why it's inconsistent and why, um, you know, there are certain times we're talking to people and basically they give us the look, Hey, if you would just die, the world would be better. <laughs> and it's because <laughs> we're not telling them what we want. And then we're beating the beating them up over not producing results. And so right. I don't care what your benchmarks are. So the reality is any team leader, the main, 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 main benchmark, the first one is the number of leads produced on a weekly basis. So if you have four team members and we say you're supposed to produce 25 leads per month per team member, that means you're supposed to produce 100 for the month, which means you need 25 for the week. So start there. And then if you get to 25, how many do you expect to meet with? How many do you expect them to close? Just start measuring the business. And here's the cool thing. So I don't know who all's on. I'm gonna, uh, Kylie Stone uh, asked us if we'd send this information uh, after the webinar. And so I'm going to say, so if Kylie is managing something, even if she gives expectations that are not exactly right under industry standards, it doesn't matter because she's giving the people something or she or he is giving the people something to shoot for. And I know that sounds right. weird, but, but, but well, no, I, I get it. Okay. I get it. You got to give them some, you got to give them something to shoot for and then you make adjustments to help them keep getting better and closer to that number. Yep. And then every, cause because we have the meeting rhythms every week, we're reviewing the same tracking information with the same people. So in our weekly meeting, every agent has a, a little, a little, um, a tent folded up in front of them. It looks like this sitting on the table in front of them. 
and it, there's nothing on this. This is a bill from somebody. And Burl, you were trying to look to see. Um, and it says the first thing they do is they say whether or not they met their definition of success for the prior week. And my agents, their definition of success can only be the number of new face prospects they meet with face to face each week. It can't be anything else. And so for my agents, it's always too <coughs> brand new. Then it'll show, are, they'll have to answer, are they on track for their monthly goals and are they on track for their annual goals? Then they'll have Perfect. to review all of the face-to-faces -face they had each week, all of the handoffs I mean. They'll have to say which ones they met with, which ones they didn't. The ones they didn't will help them get creative ways to make sure they get face-to-face -face with them. And then they'll have to review any Cs that have converted to Bs or Bs that have converted to As. And we do the same thing every week. But what's interesting is even though it's on a card in front of them, I sometimes get off track and don't make them follow it. And if I just make them follow the plan, their conversion rates go up. And listen to this, Verl. When I just make them follow the plan that we created two years ago, I don't have yep. to constantly think of ways to solve my problems. I just need to use the systems that are in place, which means there's so much less brain damage to me to make the business work. So Dale asked a great question, Cleve. He said, um, as a team leader, if your team's not following your direction, is this your fault for not leading or the team member because they're not following instructions? And then, um, you know, he says, I see this from, I see, uh, sorry, that's Tracy. I see that from, you know, new young agents. Whose fault is it? So, um, okay. So number one, sometimes benchmarks do need to be adjusted. So I work with the sales team there in Salt Lake City. And the reality is, is that we probably established benchmarks for them in the beginning that were too high. They're not possible to reach that number, but you don't just start changing them down until you hit the number. So it's sort of a combination of setting reasonable industry standard benchmarks. And eventually, if someone is not meeting them, you probably have to make it painful enough on them to, um, to, to, so that it creates an uncomfortable enough situation so that if they can't deliver what you want, they probably would feel more comfortable somewhere else. And I know that sounds terrible. So you can't just let them keep missing things week after week after week. But the reality is as a team leader, here's what happens. You know, they miss their, their face to face meetings for the week and we ask them to get back on track next week and they don't. If they're missing numbers consistently, you as the team leader must help them come up with a plan for how they're going to fix that problem. So when you have a problem, you dig one step deeper into the problem to help them come up with the solution. What are they going to do? What are they going to say? What is it about what we're asking them to do that they might misunderstand? Meaning, I had a person who didn't understand that a face-to-face -face meeting with a potential buyer or seller prospect didn't have to be somebody who was ready to buy or sell now. I just wanted them to meet with anyone. So I, have, I put in place the sober rule, S-O-B-E-R, like not drunk. And so I say, you have to meet with two new people face to face each week, even if both of them are not sober. Because I want them to understand, just freaking get in front of people. And I don't want to go out and meet with drunk people. My point is, just get out and meet with people and try to be interested in helping them solve their problems, digging in, understand what they want to do, and work through these things. So most of the way we think as leaders, I'm telling you what we need to do from a leadership standpoint is exactly the opposite of the way we think. I love that. I love the sober rule. Troy agrees with it as well. Yes. And, he's, and listen, I tend to probably let people stay around a little too long, but the reality is that I continue to thump the same message, the same message, the same message. And either over time, they start to catch the spirit, they start to catch the message, uh, or they don't. So when, when we talk about tracking, 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 so first, this is lead flow. This is from a, a sync account, I believe, and it shows the total leads and the new leads and the appointment set and the showings and the under contracts and the solds. And so in this case, 2,309 leads turned into 50 solds. So if we look at that number, um, 50 divided. It's a good by number, actually. It's a 2.16% conversion rate. So that's really very high. Uh, and so you have to know exactly where everybody is because the reality is most of us spend so much money on leads that it stresses us out. And if we're going to invest <coughs> 150 or 250 or $12 or $15 in a lead, or it's just going to be a lead that comes directly to me. 
or to my wife or somebody, we need to make sure that we're getting our money's worth out of all of those. So we think, hey, bro, let me tell you how the DSH works and then I'm just going to expect you to do it. So let me right. <laughs> to everybody on the call. It will not work the, that way. It is not supposed to work that way. And you'll have to message about DSH and tracking things until you're either out of the real estate business or dead or both. And so you can't stop messaging because they get off track. So what's interesting is, Verl, you and I traveled together a couple of weeks ago. And in different cases, we would pull up different, and you didn't see me do the next couple of days, but in different cases, we would pull up the DSH. And Verl, we would look at only the real prospecting activities, the calls, the emails, the texts, the handwritten notes, the open houses and the door knocking. So there's only five categories, right. the real prospecting activities, the rest of them you're getting points, but you're getting the points as a result of the prospecting. So it, it, it's not a prospecting point. And here's what happened. In all cases, people needing between 229 and 275 prospecting points to get a closing. Now, I have people on my team that I've been talking to about DSH for five years. And every time we start digging into the details, they're confused on how the thing works. Now, it's not my fault. It's not their fault. That's human nature. That's the way it works. But I have to continue to ask them to do their DSH points. Does that make sense? I mean, it yeah, but I think Nate will tell you all his people follow it every day, right to the letter. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> and so, so he, but here's the deal. So as entrepreneurs, we say, hey, go do this and you'll be successful. And then we go away for a week and don't pay attention to what's going on. We come back, we look at the DH, DSH numbers. They're not wrong. And then our tendency is to judge them as if they don't have the interest in making it work. They're not motivated. They don't, they're not smart enough. They don't have the ability. But the reality is they don't have the appropriate understanding of how the activities on a daily basis turn into results. So if you think about this, take your average agent on a team and what are they looking for, Nate Martinez, when they get a lead? What they're looking for, they're looking for a sale, you know? And, and, yeah. and specifically, they're looking for a sale that won't put up too much of a fight. If the people mm -hmm. had already seen the property and already written up most of the paperwork, then that would be ideal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, but I mean, it doesn't yeah. exist. You know, what's really interesting that I, that I think with the DSH that, that is really dissecting what the, the rhythm is, right? If somebody puts in 200 emails, that's really not prospecting, right? But 200 calls or 200 door knocks, those are really prospecting activities. And, so, and a, te a text message is probably different than an email as well. So, so, mm -hmm. so you're exactly right. Hey, Burl, I got a couple more slides I want to try to go through. Um, the greatest salesman in the world, everybody should be using this, but you shouldn't be using it for the reason you think you're supposed to be using it. So we think as leaders, we're supposed to tell people how to think and that they're going to actually start thinking that way. Well, let me help you with something. There's not a person in the world that gives a flying crap what you think. I'm sorry. They care what they think. They care what they feel because they come to this. Love it, Nate. So everybody today, is the cumulative total of everything that has happened to them so far in life. So the reason Nate Martinez thinks differently than Cleve Gaddis and Cleve Gaddis thinks differently than Nate Martinez is we grew up and we live different lives. So it is Nate's reality, how he thinks it is my reality, how I think. And we both got there. Honestly, the greatest salesman in the world is designed to make people think differently because if we change the way people think, then we can change their beliefs, then we can change their actions. That's something that Burl has made loud and clear to me over time. And so what I do with the greatest salesman in the world is I actually have an agent in my weekly meeting read only a paragraph. So you can see just one little paragraph. And we're not looking for the surface meaning, we're looking for the deeper meaning. So we're looking for the underlying meaning. So this morning, we were in I am nature's greatest miracle. And the paragraph was a bit confusing and people don't understand it anyway. But my agent who read it said, nobody can do it like me. And I must never underestimate my ability to do more than I'm doing today. And he nailed it. He nailed exactly that. the message that was trying to be communicated. Nobody was trying to tell him he was special. 
Nobody was trying to tell him he was better than everybody else. What they were trying to say is he has unlimited potential and whatever he's doing today is insignificant compared to what he really can do. And see, when I get the team member to get that definition, when I get them to think that way, that's when everything starts to change. So don't use the greatest salesman in the world to lecture your people on how they should think differently. Don't tell people they should think like you think because they can only think like they think. And if you're going to influence that, you have to give them ways to have new experiences so that they change their beliefs. Now, this is my final point. And it, this is something that when I watch in teams, I do not do this because I grew up teaching people to sell vacuum cleaners. And when you're teaching people to sell vacuum cleaners in rural Indiana and in rural South Carolina and rural Atlanta and all over the Midwest U.S., you do not ever say to them that their lack of results is affecting the team because they don't give a flying crap about the total results of the team. These people are right on the first rung about to fall off the bottom financial rung and be homeless or something. So they're doing this because they're sort of desperate. And it was a great lesson for me. So because when someone is not performing, I don't want to make them feel obligated to the team for the results of the team to perform. I want them to feel obligated for their families and for their own financial future to perform. So the worse somebody is performing, the more I make the message specific to them. So if Nate Martinez, let's just say, for example, I think Nate Martinez is a fantastic father. But if Nate wanted to be a great father and I saw him doing things that indicated he was not a great father, and I pointed those things out to him, he would not be offended at me for doing that. He would actually probably be appreciative of me doing that. So if Verl Workman says, I want to perform at this level financially, and then Verl Workman is not doing the things he needs to to perform at that level, I can put as much pressure as I want to for him to perform for his own goals and his own future and his own family, not mine and not my team. And they'll understand it more because remember, you cannot make an external change to the way somebody thinks. All changes to the way people think come from inside that person, not from outside. Now, we can influence it from the outside, but it's an internal thing. And guys, half of this stuff that I'm talking about today is in an effort to get me to lead people correctly. So it's a little bit of self-defense to try to think of things differently so I can use my energy in very positive ways. And so hopefully the next time you're faced, something, faced with something in business, it seems like a leadership challenge. Think to yourself, what do I feel in my soul today? And then say to yourself, I probably need to be doing the opposite. Because if you just <laughs> learn to recognize that trigger, so I, they've done this, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to get them a, give them a piece of their mind. Well, you probably need to have a sit down, be genuinely concerned, show them some humanity, show them some love. Even if they did something that was the stupidest thing you can imagine, you still probably need to do the opposite of what your gut tells you you need to do. You know, it makes sense. And I, I think that uh, when you were going through the process of, having them realize how it affects their family, not how it affects the team. That, that goes back to what Nate was saying about really tying in and understanding what their why is. And if you understand the real why, you can do that. But if you don't take the time to find out what's important to them, then you're just a bunch of noise beating them up for not doing activities and putting their numbers in the trackers. You know, and what's interesting, uh, one of the people who's probably closest to Nate, I get the chance to talk to her quite often. She's been with Nate for 20-something years. I don't even know how long. It's been forever. And, you know, they have to have a professional relationship where Nate can talk to her about where she's not performing or things should change. But she freaking loves him. She loves him because Nate want what's, wants what's best for her. And then the reality is that he can put as much pressure as he wants on her if it's something that's good for her. And so that is a perfect visual in-person example of how we have to constantly deal with gaps in performance, how we need to do better. But the reality is it's all done with love. And she would run through a wall for Nate. Now, she wants to kill him sometimes, but she could run through a wall. She would run through a wall for him. Yeah, she so I got a couple. There's a couple questions. Let me ask him and let's see. It says, this is to Cleve says, 
Um, Cleve, what do we do to be a fly on the wall in your next Monday huddle? How do I, how do I become a fly on the wall? Do you ever record those? Um, no, but uh, I mean, anybody who wants to, you will not be impressed, but uh, anybody who wants to, to reach out, uh, let me give you my phone number. It's 404-271-4275. If you want to text me, I'll set you up where you can be on one of those. You will not be impressed. So we have our Monday huddles. What happened? Here's the DSH for the last week. What happened since we met on Friday? What do you plan to do this week? Bye. That's it. I just described our whole huddle. I know. You know what's impressive is that you do it. You do it consistently, and you follow the plan. You have and, and most of the time when I get up on Monday, I'm like, oh, can, is it okay if I curse? Oh, shit. I got to do another one of these damn huddles. That's what I think. <laughs> but then I remember it's the consistency, the stability that I have to give these people. That's what they need from me. So I need to do it even if I don't feel like doing it. So, Nate, real quick, I'm going to do one more question. I'm going to end it with a comment. Uh, Nate, how do you teach a – how do you teach an individual who constantly questions everything? How do you teach them? They constantly are uh, challenging or questioning you. They're the negative Nelly, the negative Nancy. How do you, how do you bring them along and get them so they're not so uh, negative all the time? Well, you know, I think, uh, I think, I think it's time, right? It's uh, I, you got to pour an awful lot of love into a person like that, right? Because if you don't start with that, you're just going to kick them to the curb, right? And uh, yeah. I think uh, I think using other people's examples, you know, is when you can bring like when I brought my team to uh, leverage, right? It it was very impactful because it's not me telling the story; it's somebody else's story they're hearing firsthand. Uh, when I got to take Nate to coach training, again, it's it, it's it's somebody else's message. You know, they don't always listen to you. Uh, I, I have to close with this. Uh, my team, Sarah, right? She used to coin my meetings as team beatings. And I, and they were rough, right? I would say the beatings would continue until morale improves. And, and, you know, I think because of coaching and because of Burl, because of Cleve, and, you know, I think we're making a good transition and being better leaders and being better in, in, our, te in our team meeting environments. And, and, and there's not a day that I go by that I'll learn something from you two gentlemen. So thank you for sharing. Team meetings. Well, I, I appreciate that. that. You got to turn so your team Troy, meetings to team meetings. <laughs> team meetings to team meetings. I love it. No, the so Troy way. did that. <laughs> Treat team meetings to team meetings. So Troy said this, and I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up with this. He said, I'm so glad I joined work, but I've learned more today than I've learned in the 20 previous years of sales in corporate America. Thank you, Nate and Cleve. Great stuff. And I, I think it. that's a great way to sum this call up. Thank you for being so generous with uh, what it means to be leaders in your own businesses. And I appreciate all that you do for us at Workmen and for what you do for your clients. Uh, there's a few things that we want to just make available. These are in your, in your drive, and you can get a hold of them. But if you just go to workmansuccess.com forward slash leader within, we'll make it easier to get the daily huddle outline. We'll give you the downloads to them. They'll be right in your inbox. And then, of course, this is recorded, and this will be in, the, in, the, in your training center. And so you'll be able to go back and listen to some of the top tips and topics that we, were discussed today. Any final thoughts from you, Nate, and then Cleve? No, I just think leadership is a, it's a journey, right? I think, if, as you can just hit, hear Cleve's passion for, for learning and teaching and sharing, it's, it's, it, he's read a book. He's been to a seminar. Uh, we just never stop learning, and, and I think none of us should ever stop learning. Thank you. Final thoughts, Cleve? Just two things. Um, the training assessment for buyer's agent, most people have never seen that. And so it allows you when you hire a new buyer's agent 90 days in or six months in to, to evaluate them based on everything they should know to do based on the workman system. So it's awesome. And then the self-evaluation form you could use for an agent on your team or an employee that allows them to evaluate themselves. And I will tell you, if you let them tell you what they think about what they're doing and you compare that to what you think they're doing, those two things are not even close. 100% of the time, they're not even close. They're even similar. And so, so you true. help them work on things that are important to you that they might not even understand is important to you. Well, thank you from my uh, bottom of my heart, Cleve and Nate. Thanks for being here. Thanks for all you do. Have an amazing rest of your week. I'll see you all at Leverage 2020, and I'll see you on the next coaches. Uh, I'll see you next on the next team leader call. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Bye. Bye. Bye.